Okay, if we could turn again in the scriptures, please, to the book of Judges, chapter 6. We're going to read from verse 33 to the end of the chapter, and we're going to think about the fleece incident. And so beginning in Judges 6, verse 33, it says, Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher, and unto Zebulun, and unto Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early in the morning and thrust the fleece together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word to our hearts. So we see in verse 33 that the uh, the gathering of the enemy uh, together, it, perhaps their annual uh, raiding season, they're getting ready to come into the land again and to uh, rob it of its uh, plenty. Uh, and so they, they gathered together and uh, quite uh, a, a unified bunch of the Midianites, the Malachites, the children of the East, all gathered together for one purpose, and that is to uh, spoil Israel. Of course, we see that that's going to happen in a coming day when all the nations are going to gather together in that same valley of Jezreel with the same intent on spoiling Israel completely. Uh, but notice it says that when this occurred this year, something different is happening. It says this, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. And so we, we find God's Spirit now comes upon. Now, again, remember Old Testament uh, versus New Testament. Old Testament, the Holy Spirit of God came upon people for acts of service, whether it be kings, whether it be judges, whether it be priests. Old Testament that's the teaching of that. The New Testament is that we're permanently indwelt by the Spirit of God. But nevertheless, even though we're permanently indwelt by the Spirit of God, if we're to do any kind of service for the Lord, uh, it would behove us to be sure that we're filled with the Holy Spirit to serve him. And I want you to notice, again, no matter how big the enemy is, there's a constant reminder in Scripture that the Lord is greater and I want to just look at a couple of scriptures that uh, are encouraging to us as we consider this. First one is in Second Chronicles. I'd like us just to turn there to uh, Second Chronicles chapter 32 and verses 7 and 8. Just, just to get this sense that although the enemies are real and the enemies seem to be overwhelming at times, uh, compared to our situation, and yet we read this in Second uh, Chronicles 32, verse 7, Be strong and courageous, be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles and the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Now, not, not that there was more numerically amongst the tiny nation of Judah than this massed enemy, but what gave them the edge 
was, as Hezekiah reminded them, the Lord our God is with us to help us and to fight our battles for us. And what a wonderful thing it is to know that. And again, just to see in New Testament terminology, I'd like you to turn with me to First Epistle of John, please. First Epistle of John, verse uh, chapter 4, verse 4. It says, you're of God, little children, and have overcome them. That's our enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. You've overcome them. How have you done that? It says, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And what a wonderful reminder today, as it seems like the enemies of God are overwhelming. The whole media, uh, the governments of this world, it seems like there's their agenda, there's their plans, and it seems like it's overwhelming. And yet, what a reminder to know that if God is with us, who can be against us? And we're on the, the victory side because the Lord is with us to fight our battles, as Hezekiah saw. And so, even though there's this mass gathering, we have this encouraging word, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Now, when did the Spirit of the Lord come upon Gideon? We've already seen when he tore down the idols that were in his father's house. It doesn't come up, the spirit does not come upon him until he deals with that which is hindering. Okay. Uh, that uh, how could he go out against idolaters when he himself is in a household where idolatry is practiced? And so, just that if we want to you know the fullness of the spirit, uh, with, there has to be a dealing with anything that would hinder his using us. And we often sing emptied that thou wouldest fill me a clean vessel in thy hands. And so there is a sense of, is there anything in our lives that is, that is grieving the Spirit of God, that is quenching the Spirit of God, that is hindering our usefulness in divine service? And if there is, we have to deal with that first, tear down the idols so that we're in a position where the Spirit of God can infill in, in us and empower us for divine service. And so he blows the trumpet, uh, gathering uh, Israel together. Abiezer was gathered to him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and gathered, they gathered after him. He sent messages to Asher, to Zebulun, to Naphtali. They came to meet them. Now, I want you to notice that uh, one of the largest tribes, Ephraim, uh, still in that region, were not called. And we'll, we'll see a little bit of why that is the case when we get to chapter eight, but I want you just to notice their absence. But these are the ones that are gathered together. And uh, so there's now uh, a, a gathering of a force uh, that is going to be with Gideon, actually going to be a, a total of 32,000 men under his command. And so Gideon feels like he needs some assurance. And part of it is, like he's a farmer. He's not a military commander. Uh, you know, he's used to being behind a plow or using a flail. Uh, he's not used to uh, commanding an army of 32,000 men. And so he's, he's apprehensive. Uh, he's nervous. And so he asks the Lord to give him yet further assurances, even though the Lord has already uh, stated very plainly that, that God is going to use this man to save Israel. Uh, if you look back at 6 verse 14, the Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Verse 16 of chapter 6, the Lord said to him, surely I'll be with thee, thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And so he's had lots already of assurance from the Lord, but he feels like he needs more. Uh, he feels inadequate for the task set before him. And so he's asking the Lord to give him a fleece. Now, you know this uh, well. Uh, you've often heard it where, and it sounds very spiritual to ask the Lord, uh, Lord, I'm putting out a fleece. And so people will do things like this. They'll say, okay, Lord, if this, 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 and this happened before this day, I'll know that you're calling me or you're doing, you know, you're, you're clearly uh, want me to do something. And it, and it does sound also spiritual. And yet, in one sense, it's, it's unbelief because, as we've already said, the law has already told him, I'm going to deliver Israel, and I'm going to use you to do it. And Gideon knew the Lord had 
said that because notice he says in verse 36, Gideon said to God, if thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. <laughs> there was, he's already said, I'm going to deliver Israel from your hands. But he says, if you will save Israel by my hand. In other words, there's an element of doubt. There's an element of unbelief. God has said, I'm going to do it. And he's, are you going to do it, Lord? Are you really going to do it? I mean, I mean, I, am I even capable of this task? And so he's, he's going to ask the Lord to give him a fleece. But really, in one sense, if it had, he really should have just taken God at his word. This is going to delay the conquest for two days while God is suspending the laws of nature just to satisfy Gideon that God has already, and then there's going to be some other uh, things the law is going to do. But again, we see a couple of things. We see man's unbelief. It's very evident. He, he, God has spoken. Uh, he's, he's not just ready to act on the word as it has been written. God has spoken. And yet, we see not only man's unbelief, man's reticence to actually take God at his word, what we do see is God's incredible patience and long-suffering with his servants. And, of course, we've all experienced it, right? The Lord is, uh, is so faithful to encourage his servants and, and uh, to, to go that, uh, that extra mile uh, for us to trust him. Uh, despite the fact that we have his word and we have the promises of God. So he says in verse 37, behold, I'll put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the Jew be on the fleece only, and it dry upon all the earth beside, then I shall know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand as thou hast said. You know, again, <laughs> he's already said it, but he just needs this. So, so again, the Lord very graciously does this. And imagine this, um, you know, the dry everywhere, and yet the morning dew is on the fleece, and everywhere else is bone dry. This is, this is miraculous. This is suspending the laws of nature just to satisfy a servant who is unwilling to take God at his word. And so God does it. He, he does this amazing, and it is a, a miracle, uh, what he does. And verse uh, not it can't be explained by natural means. Verse 38, it was so, for he rose up early in the morning and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And so the Lord saturated that fleece <laughs> with a bowl full of water just to satisfy his servant. And yet Gideon said to God, let not thine anger be hot against me, and I'll speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. So again, a marvelous thing. Dew everywhere on the ground, and yet there's, and again, you know what it's like. If something's left out in the morning dew, it's going to be wet. And yet the fleece, as we shall see, is going to be bone dry. And so he says, um, God did so that night, verse 40, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. And again, quite a, a marvelous, marvelous miracle uh, that God did. And, and again, he's proving, like, if I can do this, if I can suspend the laws of nature just to bolster your faith, then I can defeat the Midianites. Right? This, is, this is the God of the supernatural, the God of infinite power, the God that, yes, made the laws of nature. Of that, there's no question. He set these laws in motion, and yet he, he being Lord of creation, is able to suspend them when he so wishes. And so, again, we need to not be troubled in any way by this. God is Lord of creation. Uh, he, and it's good to know that, isn't it? That he's in control of it all and he's able to do whatever he chooses. And so, as we've said, this man, he needed this because um, who was he that he should be a captain of 32,000 soldiers? This, this man who saw himself as less than least in his father's house and he's just a farm boy. That's all he is. That's what he's used to. And so how could God use me? And again, 
it's a bit like us, isn't it? How could God ever use me? And, you know, when we're self-focused, we tend to be, well, I'm not, I'm not, and we've got lots of examples. Moses, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak. I'm not this. I'm not that. And we have lots of reasons why God shouldn't use us. And yet we have the sure promise of God that he finds particular delight in using the weak and foolish things so no flesh should glory in his presence. And that should be an encouragement to us. Uh, that, that Yeah, there are better men, I'm sure, out there, but they're not available men, right? And often we, we hear it say, God is not looking for ability. He's looking for availability, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, there, there are a lot smarter guys out there than some of us, uh, but they're not willing they're using their smarts for selfish purposes. And so here we are, we present ourselves and God says, okay, I can use you because it's God that works. And we need to recognize that, that God is the one who works. And of course, again, we say he's very gracious and um, he does uh, affirm to this man. And again, just a couple of little interesting lessons about the fleece. First of all, the wet fleece on a dry floor and what we learn from this is God is able to communicate with his own people and bless them without the world knowing anything about it. This message was just for Gideon. He was the only one that had this experience that day of a wet fleece. Everyone else, it was just a normal day. But God, if he wants to speak to his servant, he can make it very personal, and he can. Not with audible voice, but he can affirm truth. He can speak from his word. He can, he can make truth live. And then the dry fleece on the wet ground tells us that God is able to preserve his people from what is common in the world around them. So all around, there's wet everywhere, uh, and yet the fleece is dry. And all around, we have a wicked world, but the Lord is able to preserve his own in this sea of wickedness and keep us for himself, right? God is so good at doing that. And, oh, how thankful we are for his pre preserving care of his own and how he's able to do that. So, the fleece incident. Now we want to move on to chapter seven. And I want to particularly focus on God's battle plan here. And again, God's battle plan is designed in such a way that no flesh should glory in his presence. It was God is going to make it so difficult <laughs> uh, for this to be attributed to, to human skill that the only explanation at the end of the battle is, look what God has done. And I think God loves to do that. He, he, want, he will not share his glory with anyone. And so he's going to make it impossible for anyone else to get the glory. Now, again, what's somewhat interesting is that we just studied chapter five, where Deborah expressed her disappointment that people were not presenting themselves for the battle against Jabin and Sisera. And if you remember in uh, chapter five, verse 15, and down through verse 17, it says the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley for the divisions of Reuben. There were great thoughts of heart. Why abordest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleatings of the flocks? For the division of Reuben, there was great searchings of heart. Gilead aboard beyond Jordan. Why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued in the seashore and aboard in his breaches. And so it's like she's rebuking them because they didn't offer themselves to battle. And now we come to this chapter where people are offering themselves to battle and the Lord says, go home. <laughs> and again, it just it seems bewildering, right? Because on the one hand, they're being rebuked for not showing up for battle. And in this chapter, he's telling people who did show up for battle, if you're a little bit scared, you, go, you guys go home. And so we have to ask, well, wh why? What's going on here? And again, it comes back to the, the enemy. Remember, the enemy was Midian, which means strife. And strife is caused by pride. Only by pride cometh contention. Uh, it's when we don't have a 
lowliness of mind. That's when strife and vainglory occur. And so because of the peculiar enemy that we're dealing with here, God wants to eliminate any possibility of human boasting because the only way to, to beat uh, strife is through humility. And so God is going to, as it were, whittle down Gideon's army uh, to the bare minimum. And, and uh, again, so that the only boasting will be in God, not in their military skills. And you can imagine if 32,000 had defeated an army of 135,000, they'd be, I mean, they'd be just saying, wow, what great warriors we are. I mean, well, just we're, we're crack troops. We're the, we're the SAS uh, of, of Israel in our day. Look at us, 32,000, and we have just taken it and we've given a black eye to the enemy and it would be just so filled with human pride. But God is going to eliminate any possibility of that. So the enemy does at times seem to be overwhelming even with 32,000, if you look at chapter 8 and verse 10, this is where we get the 135,000 from. It says, now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor and their hosts with them, about 15,000 men, all that were left of the host of the children of the east, for there fell 120,000 men that drew sword. So if you add the 120,000 men that have already been killed, plus uh, the 15,000 men, it gives you 135,000 men uh, being the sum total uh, of the those that were uh, the enemy against the 32,000 men that uh, Gideon has to deal with. So let's just think about odds. We're going we're gonna to talk a lot about odds. Now, again, I'm not a gambling man, but kind of odds are interesting, especially when it comes to, uh, the, for instance, the odds of the miracles of the Lord Jesus uh, all being fulfilled by one person. They're just absolutely overwhelming. They're great proof, really, of the only explanation is this is true uh, because it's against all odds that these things could occur. But so when we think of the odds here, right now, 135,000 against 32,000, uh, that is four to one against the Isra Israelites winning. And yet what God says is the odds are too heavily stacked in your favor, Gideon, <laughs> even though you're four to one uh, against you winning, that's too heavy. We've got to whittle it down somewhat. And so he, he has, has got to, as it were, eliminate some of these excess troops. And so when we get to verse 1, it says, Then Jeroboam, uh, let, remember that means let Baal plead. That's the nickname that Gideon got because uh, he pulled down Baal's altar. And, and so Jeroboam is let Baal plead. In other words, if he's really God, why don't he fight for himself? Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Harod. So the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. The well of Harod, and that word Harod means fountain of trembling. And when we're going to see that 22,000 of them were scared, I suppose it was appropriately named as they faced this army of 135,000, they were gathered at this well, and uh, and there's, um, well, some of them are trembling. Some of them are nervous, and so a fountain of trembling. And, uh, and, of course, they might well have been excused for that. And so there, this the enemy was about four to five miles from this well of Harod in the Valley of Jezreel, but again, we don't know how many spies they'd sent out, how many advanced kind of pioneers were around. And so this well uh, is, is going to be a place of testing. They don't realize it, uh, that it's going to be a place of testing. Uh, but again, they're in the face of overwhelming odds. And so it says in verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, mine own hand hath saved me. And so we get the, the explanation here of why this army was too big 
with 32,000 men. It says, God is saying, if they won the victory, they would vaunt themselves again me, against me, saying, uh, <clears throat> mine own hand hath saved me. So they would take the credit. They would get the glory. And so we can't have this. We can't have man getting the glory. And so he's not going to allow any room for human boasting. And there is a tendency, isn't there, in God's people to glorify their own efforts, to trust in their own proven methods, to credit their own contributions, to think well of their cleverness. And the Lord frequently insists that his people be reduced to utter helplessness so they must recognize that their deliverance can only be chalked up to the Lord's power and mercy. So sometimes the Lord has to, as it were, whittle things down so we get desperate enough to cry out to him instead of trusting in our own cleverness and our own methods and our own plans. And, and so he has to do this. And it, it's an interesting question. Um, does it not teach us that sometimes he can't trust us with his work unless we realize how inadequate we are to do it? Because we, we might be tempted to boast, and that would, that would rob God of that which is rightfully his, his glory. And, and so I wonder, can God trust us? Some of us have been praying for revival. I, a good question to ask ourselves, can God trust us with revival? Or would we somehow say, well, it's because we prayed, it's because we did this, it's because we, or, or would we be quick to say, look what God has done? See, if we're quick to do that, then God says, okay, I can do this. I can use you. But the minute we would dare to impinge on his glory, he says, no, I'm sorry, I can't use you. I have to find somebody else. I have to find somebody who's never heard of themselves. I've got to find somebody who will would just, the, the only explanation could be, it's me. Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24 says this, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Why was Paul so usable by God? Because he said, I'm not going to glory in anything, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> that was his boast. Uh, that's all he could boast in. Uh, and that's all that he would boast in. And so we find in verse 3, it says, Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. So the first element to be removed is the fearful element. Anybody scared? Are you scared? You know, I mean, and you'd think, well, aren't they all scared? 32,000 against 135,000. But anybody that's really gripped by fear, you guys go home. You just, you just leave. You go home. And, um, and so 22,000 just walked out of camp that day. Can you imagine that? Imagine what the 10,000 were thinking. 22,000 just walked away. You see, why is it important that the fearful are removed? Just look back to Deuteronomy chapter 20. This is quite biblical what's taking place. This is what the Lord had said uh, in his commands to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 20 and verse 8, it says, The officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house. Let his brethren's heart faint as well, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. And, and of course, the reason why God says all the ones that are fearful 
you guys go home is because fear is contagious. And so if fear comes into the camp, and we're going to see that demonstrated in the camp of Midian, people panic and people don't lose discipline and there's chaos and it spreads and it's contagious. And so God says, anybody who is fearful, you go home. We don't want you in the battle because your scaredness, your your trembling is gonna is gonna affect everybody else. It's gonna it's going to, as it were, spread like wildfire through the camp. <clears throat> Human reasoning would have decreed that Gideon needed more men for the conflict, not less. And as they had assembled, nobody would have believed that so many of them would be fearful and afraid. And the, the language of, of is really literally downright afraid. I mean, they were really scared. And of course, the, to the extent they were prepared to de desert the cause. And again, part of that fear, part of that fear, unbelief, hadn't they got the promise that the Lord was going to fight battles for them? I mean, th that's what God has given to Israel. 22,000 of them had no expectation of victory. They were conditioned to accept the day of small things as normative, and they had no expectation that God was going to work. And so unbelief led to fear. And so the fearful and the afraid go home. Now, this is very relevant um, because I, I do believe that some of the things that we've experienced in recent days, last two years, fear has really gripped the hearts of many of God's people. The pandemic and all of these things. And people have acted irrationally because of fear. In 2 Timothy 1.7, this is New Testament truth brought out from this passage in a very real way in Gideon. But it says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so we should not be gripped with fear. It's not that these things are not real, but the worst thing that could happen in the COVID pandemic is you could go home to heaven early. Is that tough? <laughs> well, if we really believe heaven is far better, it shouldn't grip us that much, should it? But fear has gripped the hearts of many of God's people. It's interesting. In George Mueller's day, there was a pandemic as well. It's a cholera epidemic that spread through the British Isles. And God's servants, instead of retreating, went forward with the gospel into these homes, praying with people on their deathbeds. And yes, some of them got cholera and died. And some of them, the Lord preserved. But they did not retreat. They advanced the cause of the gospel. And his orphanages, why did George Mueller have all these orphanages? Because of the results of the pandemic. There were so many orphans as a result of the cholera epidemic that George Mueller felt, we got to do something about this. So now we've reduced the army from 32,000 against 135,000 to now 10,000. So the odds are changing. It's now 14 to 1 in favor of the Midianites. <laughs> so it's looking worse, humanly speaking. But God isn't done yet. And so in verse 4, it says, The Lord said to Gideon, the people are yet too many. I, I, just, I just want to use my sanctified imagination, but can you imagine what Gideon's face would look like when the Lord said to him, uh, you're still too many? What, 10,000 against 135,000? You think we're still too many? And it's interesting, isn't it? We're, we, we live in a day where there's a great lust for numbers. The mega church mentality is all around us. And it... <laughs> So this is really relevant, I think, for the day in which we live, because on the one hand, we're told, don't despise the day of small things. And then we're also told, in again, same chapter, Zechariah 4, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And so sometimes God wants us to be small, so we'll be more dependent on his power to work. 
And sometimes it has to whittle us down. So we, we lose confidence in self, in schemes and plans and plots, and we'll depend more on him and his power. So verse five, <clears throat> oh, sorry, verse four says, the people are yet too many, bring them down to the water and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, thou shalt go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. But God brings about a test to reduce the numbers yet further. And he tested them in a way in which, in the way in which they drank water. I mean, just something very every day. And he often tests his people without them knowing it. In the ordinary circumstances of life, he tests us to see whether he can use us. And so he, he talks about people being faithful in little things. And he says, if they're faithful in the little things, he said, okay, I can use you for some bigger things. You straighten chairs in the assembly, I can use you to straighten lives later on. He says, so he's looking for people who you know, have been tested, but they don't even realize. And so they were, they were unaware that they were being tested. Now, remember, we saw that this, this spring was in full view of the Midianites. There's always a danger of ambush, especially in the tall reeds that surround these springs. You see, wherever you get these springs, you get reeds. And so this is a place where uh, a, an attack uh, by enemy scouts could occur very easily. And so it says, verse 5, so he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself, likewise everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. So he's going to divide them into two groups, those that lap uh, like dogs and those that get down on their knees. And so many have seen this kind of scene that there's one group, they're on their knees, they're face down in the water drinking. The other group scoop water in their hands and they lap like dogs. And the idea is that their, their eyes are always on the enemy. They, 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 they're fervent, if you like, uh, and uh, always on watch. The fearless and the fervent, they're part of that 10,000 uh, that are still there. They're not scared. They haven't left with the 22,000 and they're there. Yes, they're satisfying their needs, but they haven't lost sight of the enemy and they haven't lost sight of the fact that they're in a conflict, that they're in a warfare. And so they're not forgetting their central purpose. They're not just living <laughs> as it were. It is necessary to quench thirst, but our absorbing necessities should not take our eyes off the real battle that we're in. And sometimes it's possible we can be so busy just looking after uh, providing for our needs that we forget that we're not left here just to provide for our needs. Yes, we have to do that, but there's a bigger picture here. We're involved in the conflict of the ages and we don't want to lose that sense of the battle. Are we really living for the Lord or are we just living? One man says this, make every occasion a great occasion, for you can never tell when somebody may be taking our measure for a larger place. <laughs> Isn't that good? Make every occasion a great occasion, for you can never tell when somebody may be taking your measure for a larger place. So the odds are going to fall even more dramatically. And so it tells us, uh, verse um, seven. Sorry, verse six. The number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, "By the three hundred men that lapped, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go, every man to his place." So that's a pretty dramatic reduction now. We've gone from 32,000 to 10,000, and now we're down to 300. And so the odds have gone from four to one against them winning to 14 to one against them winning, and now we're at 450 to one against them winning. 
Now, that's interesting, isn't it? 450 to 1. Can you remember any other time when the odds were 450 to 1? Remember Elijah on Mount Carmel? And how many were there of the prophets of Baal? 450. But remember, God was with Elijah, and he was able to win the victory on Mount Carmel. And so once again, we find ourselves in that odds of 450 to 1. We had studied Samuel together for Samuel, and remember uh, the great faith of Jonathan. There's no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few, 1 Samuel 14, verse 6. And again, today we live in a day where people are mesmerized by statistics. They think they're strong because they're big and wealthy, but numbers are no guarantee of God's blessing. In fact, Moses would assure the Jews if they would obey the Lord, one soldier would chase a thousand and two would put 10,000 to flight. That's Deuteronomy 32 and verse 30. So based on those statistics, one can chase a thousand, two put 10,000 to flight. Actually, all Gideon needed was 27 men. If he had 27 men, he could have won if they were obeying the Lord against 135,000. So 300 was generous, actually. God was being very generous to them in giving them 300. <clears throat> and so this sifting, this sorting out takes place. And God reiterates the promise to Gideon yet again. He says, the Lord said to unto Gideon, verse 7, by the 300 men that have lapped, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. So once more, this promise that God is going to save Gideon and he's going to deliver the Midianites into his hand. Let all the other people go, every man, to his place. So the promise is, is, of God is being given over and over and over again to encourage this servant who needs lots of encouragement. <clears throat> the Lord chose this straightforward test for, to, for his people to teach them the truth about their total dependence on him. 300 against 135,000 is still unbelievable odds. And salvation would not come by their strength, but God working through their weakness. And that's, again, a lesson we need to grasp. God will work through our weakness. If we put ourselves in that position where we're usable, we're clean vessels, we're, we're, we realize we're in this conflict and we realize that if God does come through on our behalf, he alone must get the victory. So now we, we move on to the preparation of Gideon in verses 9 through 15, which is uh, the barley bread. So verse 8 says, the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets, and he sent them all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. So 300 now uh, left they do have trumpets in their hands. That's going to be significant. But God has one more thing to do to just encourage his servant to prepare Gideon to lead these 300 men. And again, we see something. And this time, Gideon's not asked for it. This is, this is just pure grace. God is giving him a further encouragement. Another promise of victory and divine deliverance is going to be given to Gideon. So it says in verse 9, it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, get thee down to the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. Again, reassuring this man. But he says, if thou fear to go down, go thou with Pura, thy servant, down to the host. Now, remember, he already said all the fearful were supposed to leave camp. And then he says to Gideon, if you fear to go down against the horse, then go with poor thy servant down to the horse. So 
again, there's still some fear in the heart of Gideon, and he needs some more assurance. And because the Lord knows the fears of his servants, he knows how scared we can be in our various circumstances. Psalm 103 verse 14 says this, he knoweth our frame, he knows that we're dust. <laughs> Isn't it good to, to know that the Lord knows all about you? He knows your weaknesses. He knows your, your, your fears, uh, your apprehension. He knows everything. Nothing is, is a shock to him uh, about you at all. He knows us. He knows as well. So after three assurances of victory and three signs already, remember he, the sign of him going up in the, in the offering uh, on, on the rock, uh, and consuming uh, Gideon's offering, uh, the, the sign of the fleece, uh, he, he's going to give him another sign and another assurance, even though at this point, Gideon ought to have been brimming with confidence, and yet nothing was further from the truth. Once again, the, the power of the Lord and the weakness of the vessel kind of runs like a thread through this section. Now, it tells us in verse 11, thou shalt hear what they say, and afterwards shall thine hands be strengthened to go down to the host. Then went he down with Pura his servant onto the outside of the armed men that were in the horse. So God is now going to use from the very mouths of the heathen enemy, a message that is going, God is going to use to strengthen Gideon's hands even further, to give, to bolster his confidence yet further. And it is interesting how God's word often comes through the oddest channels. A Midianite private in the Midianite army, army is going to be God's messenger to encourage his servant. And we have, for instance, a murderous high priest prophesying in John's Gospel, chapter 11, uh, Caiaphas, you know, that this man must die for the people, right? Uh, <clears throat> you, you have a pagan governor uh, fulfilling scripture, behold the man, behold your king. I mean, it's just amazing how God uses the most unlikely instruments. And God is going to use this Midian, and he's going to give this picture of the barley. Now, we know that barley was a grain grown and used by the poor in Israel. It was always the bread of the poor. For instance, when Ezekiel is told to bake him some bread. Uh, it's the poorest bread because it's it's signifying famine conditions. Well, you're not going to be able to get the finest of the wheat and all the rest of it. So it's, it's really the bread of the poor. And I would imagine for this barley cake to roll downhill, it's probably a stale cake that's very hard, right? Because if it's soft and spongy, it's not going to do any rolling. And so, so again, just it's, a, it's, a, it's another picture, in a sense, of how God uses the weak things. And I'm sure this was quite an insult to Gideon that he's been compared uh, to a, a stale barley cake. <laughs> but that's exactly the picture that's being given here. So notice verse 13, when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream to his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for unto his hand hath God delivered Midian unto the host. So here's this application, this poor old barley cake, stale, rolling into the camp, is a picture of our hero, Gideon. And so, of course, Gideon is going to learn that barley bread in the hands of Jehovah is a force to be reckoned with. And so, again, it, it emphasizes the weakness of the servant and the greatness of God to bring deliverance. 
But notice as well that the destruction that this barley cake makes is, is comprehensive. It says, came into the tent, smote it, that it fell and overturned it, and the tent lay along. In other words, it's flattened, totally flattened. And again, what assurance. I'm going to use you, barley cake, stale barley cake Gideon, and I'm going to use you, and the enemy is going to be totally flattened at the end of this conflict. And so even now, this assurance that God is going to deliver the Midianites into Gideon's hand comes now from another source. This is not directly from the mouth of God, but this is the mouth of a, Gid a, a Midianite private. And it says again, verse 14, the fellow answered and said, this is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. So even this pagan Midianite, private utters the truth that God is about to effect a great deliver deliverance through our servant Gideon. Notice verse 15. It, it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped. That's the response of God's servant. He worshipped. He worshipped, recognizing now after all this encouragement, after all of this, uh, these signs and all the rest of it, Gideon now is in the place where God is going to be able to use him. And he bows in worship. And then it says he returned to the host of Israel and said, arise for the Lord. Arise for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Gideon's finally got the message, <laughs> and he's, he's now speaking in full agreement with God. The Lord is going to deliver the Midianites into his hand. But we will have to wait till next week to see this great deliverance affected. Our time has gone. May the Lord encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.